So I'm Carrie, um, Carrie Sparing, novelist. In my real life, I'm Dr. Carrie Maund. I'm a historian. I am not a historian of 17th century France. I'm a historian of 5th through 12th century Wales. But in my spare time, I have a thing for musketeers. And I've had a thing for musketeers since I was 15. And the BBC very kindly showed the film with Michael York and Oliver Reed and Christopher Lee. And I was watching this. And it was awesome. And it got to almost the end. And D'Artagnan was fighting Rochefort in the church. And my father said, we have to change channels now. Your mother wants to watch Robert Redford. And I didn't get to see the, the final 15 minutes, so I didn't know what happened. I love my mother dearly, but really, the sting. The sting when you could watch The Musketeers. So I trotted off to the school library and borrowed the book and went, oh my God, this is the best book in the world ever. This is even better than Lord of the Rings, which up to that point had been the best book in the world ever. And the reason was that it's just such fun. And being me, because historian, I started wondering about the background and why Dumas wrote about them and who they were and were they real people. I think I initially thought they were imaginary. I'd heard of them before the film with Michael York because... Those of who, us who are old, and I know some of us present are old, because I know the old people in the room, um, will remember the Banana Splits, which used to have a cartoon in it called The Four Musketeers, which I used to watch when I was about six. So I knew Athos, Porthos, Aramis, and D'Artagnan, but I just thought they were made up. But I did some digging, and I kept on reading books about France in the period, and I kept on reading books about Dumas, and I, as it happened, did French to A-level, and that meant I could read books in French about them. And I began to find out that these are actually real people, and various people have been studying them for more or less since Dumas wrote the book. So this is the um, very famous um, illustrations from the second edition of The Three Musketeers, the French, which was the good one. The first edition, it was originally published as a newspaper serial, and then bound as a book with those um, pictures. But there then was a lovely, glossy uh, second edition, uh, I think in the 1880s, and this is, so this is the famous picture. It's Porthos, D'Artagnan, Athos, and Aramis holding the swords. Next picture, please, Phil. <laughs> oh, dear. <laughs> anyway, so Dumas, Alexandre Dumas Père, uh, was a... French novelist and, and writer. He was a professional writer. That's him as a young man. Uh, he was born in um, 1802 in Villa Cotre, which is just outside Paris. And his father was a general in the uh, Revolutionary Army called Thomas Alexandre Dumas Davy de la Paillaterie. Um, long name. He was actually illegitimate. He was the son of a minor French nobleman and a black woman slave. And when his father, who was the Marquis of David de la Paraterie, came back to France after his mistress, Marie Cessette Dumas, died, he brought the son, Thomas, with him. And the minute Thomas set foot on land in France, he was, an, he was a freeman. Up to that point, he was a slave. The minute he arrived in France, no one could be in France and be a slave. He became a free man. And he rose to become an, a general in the Revolutionary French Army. And he married the daughter of an innkeeper. And they had Alexandre and his sister. Um, we don't know very much about his sister. But Alexandre, very proud to be mixed race. People spent a lot of time in his lifetime giving him grief about the fact that he was mixed race. Mixed race and he just ignored them. Uh, because he knew this made him better. He'd had absolute faith in his own talents. He had absolute faith. He, he, he adored his father. He based the character of Porthos on his father. People have been watching the BBC series, I imagine, which is, suffers from, from pretty costumes, pretty actors, and possibly the worst script to this side of EastEnders. I keep meaning to write them a letter out. Could they hire a writer, please? Um, but they cast a mixed-race actor to play Porthos in that. Dumas never says Porthos is mixed-race. He never tells us anything about Porthos's background. Um, but the, uh, the, the directors and producers of that series decided to basically say, equate Porthos with Thomas Alexander. And Phil, next picture, please. 
that's him. That's Dumas' father, Thomas Alexander, General Dumas. Um, there is a book about him called The Black General. Very good book, highly recommend it. So, Dumas, very ambitious. He had one thing going for him. He had beautiful handwriting. He was lazy git when it came to school. He didn't do terribly well, but he went off to Paris, having been found a job as somebody's secretary because he had beautiful handwriting. And he started writing plays because he wanted to be a writer. And he, having arrived in Paris in uh, 1823 and made friends with a bunch of other young men who wanted to become playwrights and painters, including Victor Hugo and um, Delacroix, the painter, he had a play accepted and performed at the Comédie Française in 1828-9, and the play was called Henri III et ses corps, Henry III and his court. And it was a mega, mega success. It was the first romantic play in terms of the romantic movement, Wordsworth, um, all those people fainting in coils, Byron, Keats, Shelley. Uh, it was the first romantic play uh, to be appear in Paris. It was all about adultery and duels and young men dying for love. Ladies fainted. The press were outraged. Dumas was an overnight sensation. And he wrote some more like that. But he also started writing novels because that paid better. And in those days, you wrote a novel for the newspapers. Everything was published as serials. And you were paid by the line, which was great, because it meant you did quick-fire dialogue. Dumas is the inventor of quick-fire dialogue. D'Artagnan, I say, over here, what is it, Porthos? No, I say, you keep on like this, you've gone for seven or eight pages, you're paid by the line. Tick, tick, you know, ka-ching, 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 ka-ching. Sometimes you have to count back and remember who's speaking. Next picture, please. So he started, okay, well, 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 Thomas, Ale well Thomas Alexander and his horse go for a ride. Dumas started writing um, serial novels. And he, he, came across, he came up with the idea that he'd like to make fi fictionalize the, the history of France. And he worked with collaborators because he was very, very prolific. And what the collaborators would do was go out and find potential source material and do a sort of outline for him of what the book might be about. And one of his, and, and either he or one of his collaborators, Auguste Maquet, we don't know which, found this book. Memoirs of Monsieur d'Artagnan, Captain Lieutenant and of the first company of the, the Musketeers of the King. Um, this looked to be the memoirs of a genuine historical figure who was active in the reign of Louis XIV. It's actually none of, nothing of the sort. This book, which you can find anywhere, and it's, you can now get it, it's translated into English, you can get it as an e-book, was written by a character by the name of Gatien de Cotil de Sandra, of whom I cannot show you a picture because none survives, who was a professional troublemaker. Um, think uh, Ian Hislop, only more venal. Gatien, Côté de Sandra's job was to write anything for money. And what really sold, he was, he was around in the second half of the reign of Louis XIV, the second half of the 17th century, what really sold was scurrilous, scandalous gossip and muckraking about the court. If he was alive today, he'd be a journalist for the sun. Or Poss you know, he, this is the sort of guy we're talking about. So he wrote what's called pseudo-memoirs. He'd find that someone who was famous and dead and write their memoirs, including as many jokes about um, a, a, as much adultery, as much courtiers behaving badly, and as much scatological humor as he could possibly pack in, and a few historical incidents. And one of the people he heard of was D'Artagnan, who was a real person, really was Captain Lieutenant of Musketeers, and who had died in uh, 1673. So Gatien de Courtier de Sandra, in around 1702, produced this. It has very little to do with the historical D'Artagnan other than his name. But it sold, because it had anecdotes about Cardinal Mazarin, who everyone remem who'd been dead for a long time, but everyone hated, and could be, remi could be treated as a, a sort of stand-in for currently current royal ministers who everyone hated, and it implied that Louis XIV's mother was no better than she should have been, and various other things. And it, Well, how should I put this? Courtil de Sandra was in and out of the Bastille for most of his life, and this was not his worst. He wrote all sorts of stuff. He's hilarious. Um, there's some very, very interesting books on the underground publishing industry in the 17th century, because 
basically how the, how the Belgians made their living at the time was that was where you got your book published if it was banned in France or Italy or Spain. And then it gets smuggled and you'd have the French army kind of poking loads of hay, looking for, looking for evil books that would... It's like looking for terrorists, only they were looking for things that said the king's mistress, you know, had slept with her dog and practiced the black mass on her stomach. There really was one that said that, about the black mass, not the dog. Okay, next picture, please. That, yeah. So, D'Artagnan. This is the only known picture of the actual D'Artagnan, and it's from the Memoirs of D'Artagnan by Courtier de Sandra, published in 1702. We don't know that it's actually connected to the real D'Artagnan, who died 30 years earlier. It's possible. His name wasn't, in fact, D'Artagnan. In the book, D'Artagnan is called D'Artagnan, and all the other three are all using pseudonyms. In reality, the other three really well called Athos, Porthos, and Aramis, or very similar names to that. D'Artagnan's name was Charles de Bats Castelmore. And he called himself Charles D'Artagnan because his mother was a member of the Montesquieu d'Artagnan family, who were much better known than his. He came from Gascony, uh, which is the bottom, um, bottom left-hand corner of France, up against the Pyrenees. Think Scotland. It had a reputation of having hot-headed young men who joined the army, fought duels, were a lot of trouble, but were terribly, terribly brave and rather dashing. Um, he, came for, he, he was a younger son, and a way to make a living was to join the army. He went off to Paris. Um, he joined the musketeers in around, in some point in the 16, sorry, in the 1630s. Dumas sets the book, The Three Musketeers, in the period 1625 to 1628. D'Artagnan was not, in fact, a musketeer until after that, but Dumas transposed Courtil de Sandra's story back by 10, 15 years so he could put it in a historically more exciting period. We know Charles was in the Musketeers in the 1630s. During the 1640s, he became a special courier to Cardinal Mazarin, who was the first minister of France. This was in the minority of Louis XIV. So with Mazarin and the regent ruled, ruled together, everyone hated Mazarin, but uh, Charles was loyal to him. And this paid off because when Louis XIV became king, he was really pissed off with all his aristocracy who'd spent the intervening period having a civil war at him. Um, it's called the Fronde. Uh, but D'Artagnan, who, who was calling himself D'Artagnan because of a famous name, had been loyal, so he was rewarded and he went up and up and up. First of all, he became sub-lieutenant of musketeers and later on captain-lieutenant, which is basically person in charge of the musketeers. The musketeers were an elite regiment. They were in the king's royal household. They were his special pet soldiers. They were, the, they were always his personal escort. They were always in the van whenever he went anywhere. They were always in the van whenever he travelled with his armies. And they, because they were light... They were like cavalry. They were sharpshooters and like cavalry. They were usually used for the most dangerous missions in war. They were frequently, for example, sent in to be the first people to open, a, uh, open up a, an attack on a besieged city and things like that. And that, in fact, is how, in the end, D'Artagnan, the historical D'Artagnan, died. He was killed at the siege. Next photograph, please, Phil. Uh, yes, that's where he was born. That's... that's um, Lupiac in Gascony. That's the chateau that he was, his family owned and where he was born. Next picture, please. Uh, yes, OK. I, I'm cutting here because we're short of time. Shortly before he died, he, he, his final position, other than Captain of Musketeers, was Governor of Lille. Uh, this was in... Uh, Louis XIV was at war with the Spanish in Holland and northern France and Belgium, the way you do. And he decided to fortify all the cities as he grabbed them, and Lille was one he grabbed off the Spanish. And he had it fortified at by Vauban, who was a great military engineer of the period. And D'Artagnan was sent in to be governor while this was being built, and he fell out with the engineer. And there is a his the only actual things belonging to D'Artagnan that survive are a series of letters, which are in the military archives in Paris, in which D'Artagnan, dear King Louis and War Minister Louvois, I am very bored, and the engineer is an asshole. This place is crap. I want to come back. I bet my musketeers are out of hand. Send me a relief person. By the way, the engineer is an asshole. And he basically sent Louis XIV a letter like this once a week for eight months. <laughs> and Louis XIV put up with it and sent him a replacement. But it's hysterical. If you read French, there's a French writer called Odile Bourdaz who wrote a book about D'Artagnan. It's called D'Artagnan. And she's put all the letters in the appendix in the back. They're hilarious. If you read French, go and read them. They're brilliant. 
Louis XIV has this image of being terribly authoritarian, but he really put up with crap from Charles de Batz, who really was quite... A, you have to say, Dumas in the later novels, because there are f three novels in total about the musketeers, five in the English translation, but they wrote published as three. In the later novels, Dumas is... Uh, D'Artagnan is a grumpy bastard. And, uh, yeah, Dumas didn't ever see these letters, but he clearly sensed something. Um, Courtel de Sandra had no idea about any of this. Next picture, please. That's the statue. Oh, dear. It's missing his head. Um, but that's... Uh, there's a, he was killed in the siege of Maastricht in June of 1673. And they, the, the people of Maastricht are very proud of the fact that D'Artagnan was killed tr trying, uh, taking their city off the Dutch and the, and the Spanish. And they have raised a monument to him. There's a little museum all about the siege. And they keep trying to find his grave. We don't know exactly where he's buried, but the the town of Maastricht are pretty sure they're going to find him one day. Okay, next picture. Okay, the other three, Athos, Porthos, and Aramis, uh, very, very quickly. They are real people, and they really were called Athos, Porthos, and Aramis. Ar uh, Athos was, was Armand. I'm going to have to look this one up because it's a, it's a hell of a long one. They were also, like him, Gascons. Um, they were all, apart from D'Artagnan, related to the famous Monsieur Treville, which is how they ended up in Paris. Athos's real name was Armand de Sileg d'Athos d'Autvier, and he belonged to the very, 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 very minor gentry. As in, his father and his grandfather had managed to acquire some biggish, biggish farms in a couple of hamlets and started calling themselves Lord. Um, and he went off to Paris to get his name known, became, entered the Musketeers Regiment, so he, he was related to Treville, so that's how he got in. And all we know about him, this is all we know about him, was that he was serving in the Musketeers in December of 1643. And we know he was serving in the Musketeers in December of 1643 because his death is recorded in the Paris Church of Saint-Sulpice. He had been killed, uh, probably in a duel. We don't know what the duel was about. Um, but he was killed and his, his body was buried there. Um, and it was quite normal for musketeers to get into duels. Dueling was a thing. It was strictly illegal, but they all did it. Um, this had been, in fact, this Dumas play, Henry III and his court, that was all about illegal dueling and how it was terribly cool. And that was actually, Henry III of France was actually in the, uh, the king in the late 16th century, so he was about 70 years earlier. They've still, all, young men went out and, instead of having arguments about football, they had arguments about, I don't like your hat, or you kissed my mistress, or whatever. That's Athos, very obscure. Uh, all that's left of anywhere he lived is a wall, and it's a wall that's part of a barn. Um, I dragged Phil and various of my friends to look at this when I was writing a book about these guys, and we got to Athos, Aspic, the village of which, which is a, which is three farms and a church. And our friend Austin said, well, that was a bit pointless. You could have looked at this on Google Maps. <laughs> because, um, but it's really not very, anyway, so that's Athos. Porthos, his name was Isaac or Isaac de Porto. Next slide, please, Phil. He was from Pau, which is a town in, in Gascony, rather a nice place. His family were also new gentry, but, it, but rather than the, look, I've got a hamlet, I must be a lord, it was, these guys went up through the administration. They were good local civil servants. They did well. Um, they managed to get land and influence and, and, and a small title. And next photograph. And this is their main holding. This is Lan, which is up in the Pyrenees. This is now a hotel. You can stay in the Porthos Hereditary Chateau. When I saw it, it was derelict, and I spent an awful lot of time working out if I could afford to buy it. Clearly, somebody did. I'm rather pleased about that. Um, what do we know about Porthos? He was not a musketeer. He was in the guards of Monsieur des, des Essars, which is where D'Artagnan starts in the novel. Uh, we don't know that he, he doesn't appear in the surviving musketeer regiment muster rolls. He was in Paris um, probably, we know he was in Paris in 1642, so he was there in the, at the same time that Athos was in the Musketeers. It's possible they knew each other. Des Essars and Treville were brothers-in-law, uh, but we don't know. That's, and we know he retired quite young. Next slide, please, Phil. And ended up as the subaltern in charge of, of the um, pa uh, powder magazine, the powder in the town of Navarance, back down in Gascony, which was a bit of a sinecure, because it wasn't a frontier. Um, 
it was a post usually given to someone who'd, who had been invalided out, so it's possible he'd been injured. We don't know. But his brother was quite important in the area, so it's also possible his family called him back so he could add to the family influence that they were building in the Pole hinterland. So that's Porthos. Aramis, next picture, please. Aramis is the only one of them who was actually a serious member of the nobility. The D'Artagnan was sort of yeomanry, minor gentry. Athos was a self-made gentry. Porthos was noblesse de robe, came up, you know, new money. Aramis was actually the old nobility, the noblesse de, de l'épée, the people who got there through military service to kings in the Middle Ages. His family goes back, we can trace it to the 13th century. And they were the lords of Aramitz, down in, again in Gascony. It was a, that's all that survives, that gate. Um, for some reason, the local French decided to knock the house down in the 1960s. The village of Aramitz has been complaining back at their département ever since. They're very proud of him. Um, he was nephew of Monsieur de Treville, and we know he was born around 1620 and was serving in the Musketeers around 1640, directly at the same time as Athos. D'Artagnan at this point, D'Artagnan was about 10 years older than that, this lot. Probably wasn't currently a musketeer, but he might have known them. There's no evidence he did. Um, and this, the tradition in Aramitz is that, uh, that Henri d'Aramitz and his father served at the same time in the musketeers. And he stayed in the musketeers for five or six years when he went home and married and had kids. And we last hear of him doing quite nicely in his, his holdings, which were quite... Quite, he was quite wealthy. I, uh, Port, Isaac de Porto was the wealthiest. Now, very, very quickly, because I'm over time. So that's, they are real people. Dumas took the names Athos, Porthos, and Aramis from Courtil de Sandra, who has them as three brothers that D'Artagnan meets and makes friends with. We don't know how to Courtil de Sandra had heard of them, because none of them did anything famous. Porthos's name isn't even in the muster rolls. Courtil de Sandra liked to tell people he'd been a musketeer himself. Um, but if so, it was in the second regiment. Um, D'Artagnan was captain lieutenant of the first regiment, and the Aramis and Athos were members of the first regiment. Courtil de Sandra could never have met them. He probably was about five when Athos died. So the chances are he got the names. He knew someone who knew someone who vaguely remembered these slightly odd names. And none of them were people who were famous, who had relatives who were likely to come after him with a sword. Which, if you're Courtil de Sandra, is very important because this is a man who spent at least half of his life in prison because he kept calling people dog fuckers and mother rapers and, you know, black magicians. And they weren't impressed. Madame de Mont, the king's mistress, really did not like him. Um, so it's chances are he picked the names because they sounded good. Dumas gave them the personalities that they have in the books. He made Athos the high noble. Well, actually, he was a, minor, a junior son of a family that was trying very hard to be noble by the by its tips of its fingers. He made Porthos social climbing and a man of the people. Well, yes, Porthos did come from a family like that, but uh, but rather more successful, but, but not. They weren't interested in title and titles. They were interested in money, land, and influence. He made Aramis, the, um, was going to be a churchman one of these days. He was a musketeer just for the moment. So this is the bit that I always find really amusing. Henri d'Aramitz's holding was an abbey. He was the lay abbot of the abbey of Aramitz. At this point in history, you could hold a, military, a, a, a monastery as your personal property without having being in holy orders and without the abbey actually being religious. It was a bunch of property that had one point been in church property. And he was a lay abbot, so that's quite amusing. Dumas did not know this. It's just one of those fun things. So that's, that's really, I was going to tell you a bit about the regiment, but I'm over time, so I shall stop there. Thank you very much for coming. I'm sorry that was so fast. And if Phil wants to wind forward, there are a couple of other pictures, I think. Uh, yes, there we are. And that, that's in the town of Guerre, down in Gascony. They are very popular. If everywhere you go in Gascony, someone goes, musketeers to you. And you can actually belong to the company of musketeers if you are male and wealthy and interested in wine. Because these days there is a guild of musketeers which is all about getting very, very drunk. <laughs> Thank you very much.